All rise, please. The United States District Court for the Western District of Washington is now in session. The Honorable James L. Robart presiding. Please be seated. The clerk will call this matter. Case number C-12-1282, United States of America v. City of Seattle. Counsel, please make your appearances for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Christina Fogg for the United States. Good morning, Your Honor. Tim McGaff for the United States. Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Holmes, City Attorney for the City. If I may, Your Honor, we are joined today also by Chief Best and much of her command staff, the Inspector General Judge, OPA Director Meyerberg, and Mayor Durkin, who was here at our last status conference, cannot be here today, but I'll be joining her immediately after this hearing. All right. Good morning, Your Honor. Kara LeCowart for the City of Seattle. Paul Olson for the City of Seattle. Good morning, Your Honor. David Perez, Perkins Coie for the Community Police Commission. Welcome, Counsel. The reason that I asked you all in today was to orally advise you concerning the status of full and effective compliance as defined under the consent decree, and also offer some observations and comments which will help you understand the reasons for my decision. So let us begin with a little bit of history for those of you who have not spent a lot of time on this. In December 2011, seven and a half years ago, the Department of Justice released its report concerning the Seattle Police Department. In July 2012, the United States filed a complaint naming the City of Seattle and simultaneously filed a settlement agreement and a stipulated order of resolution. Those were taken under advisement by the court, and on September 2012, the settlement agreement was approved. Because it makes a difference in what I say in the course of these remarks, I'll note that as part of that consent agreement, there are two phases mentioned. One is phase one, which is after the attainment of full and effective compliance with the terms of the consent decree. And then phase two, which is a requirement that the city maintain compliance for a two-year period. In June of 2017, the City Council adopted what we have taken to calling the accountability ordinance. In January 10, 2018, I entered an order finding full and effective compliance with the consent decree, except carving out one area, which we were unable to determine full and effective compliance. And that was because of the pending collective bargaining negotiations with the Seattle Police Officers Guild, SPOG as it's often called, which would include discipline and accountability issues. On March 13, 2018, I entered an order approving the sustainment period plan, which were a series of assessments of compliance with the consent decree, which were to be completed during this period of full and effective compliance. Most recently, of significant events, November 2018, the city and SPOG reached agreement on a new collective bargaining agreement, which we many times call a CBA. On December 3, 2018, I issued an order to show cause concerning the question of was the city out of compliance, full and effective compliance, due to the CBA's rejection of reforms that were included in the accountability ordinance. As I will more fully describe today and in the written order which we will be filing, the city finds, or the court finds as follows. The court finds that the city has fallen partially out 
uh, full and effective compliance with the consent decree. The court does not find the city has fallen out of compliance in any of the areas listed in the phase two sustainment plan that are covered by the pending audits. And the court is still hopeful that the city can complete these assessments and discharge those areas of the consent decree within the pending two-year sustainment period. The court, however, does find the city is out of compliance with the consent decree in one area of responsibility, namely accountability. With respect to this area, the city will need to come back into full and effective compliance with the consent decree and then maintain that compliance for two years. For those of you who don't follow this as carefully as some of us are required to do so, basically where we are today is that much has been accomplished and less remains to be done, but what remains is both required and very important. For the first topic then that I'd like to cover is the status of the assignment areas, uh, sustainment areas. For the party's convenience, they have tended to group them into 10, uh, and I'll briefly touch on each of them. The first three are what probably got us here in the first place, which was use of force. Those areas include force reporting and investigation, <coughs> the force review board, and the type two force investigation area. I find that there has been <coughs> improvement and continues to be full and effective compliance with the consent decree in those areas. Much of the change that the court has observed in the Seattle Police Department is the data analysis platform that has been adopted. And not without issues, and not without continued uh, encouragement, but it has made a significant difference. We know that there is less use of force. We know that crisis intervention and de-escalation have been part of that. We know that the force investigation teams have been performing. In terms of the force review board, the areas of type 3 force and some types of type 2 force have been brought to the forefront and the city has or the police department has concentrated some of its attention on the question of type 2 force investigations. Therefore I find that full and effective compliance continues in those areas. Another area mentioned in the uh, sustainment plan is that of community confidence. I think it is extraordinary that in the most recent polling that has been done that the police have achieved a 74 percent approval rating. That's a remarkable number not only in terms of this department but also on a nationwide scale. I am the first to acknowledge that there is a disparity among racial groups in its approval of the Seattle Police Department. Uh, I don't however find that surprising given that that is a trend that exists across the United States. I think it is significant that 85% of the calls of the encounters that the Seattle Police Department have occur when an officer is dispatched by a 911 call, 911, which is contrary to the no suspicion stop and frisk approach taken by some other departments. I therefore find full compliance and effective compliance in regards to community confidence. The Office of Public Accountability is another one of the sustainment areas. Um, OPA is managed by Director Meyerberg. They seem to be doing a very good job and I find full and effective compliance. The fifth area is crisis intervention and use of force. <clears throat> this is perhaps the most remarkable accomplishment of the Seattle Police Department and it is one that they deserve a great deal of credit for. We know that the data analysis platform gives us a much better sense of the 
populations that we are dealing with. <clears throat> and I know that the training which has been deployed in the concepts of de-escalation, while not universally well received, um, have worked and it is now a national model on how to proceed. Therefore, in terms of crisis intervention and use of force, I find full and effective compliance. Sixth category is that of supervision. That has been an issue that we have tackled since the start of this. There are two things that I believe have made a significant difference in terms of that. One is the patrol staffing approach. Secondly is better training in supervision. And third has been an increase in the number of sergeants that are available to supervise. I find that in the area of supervision at this time, the city and the police department are still in full and effective compliance. The next <clears throat> area is the early intervention system. This is one that has not worked as well as anyone has hoped. Um, and it now is the study of national academic uh, inquiry. The early models which we urged you to adopt dealt with a series of triggers, alerts, and thresholds. They didn't accomplish what it is that we hope to accomplish with the early intervention system. The city has uh, used a study from Washington State University. Uh, there's a study going on out of Chicago. And I believe that while this is a work in progress, that progress is sufficient to continue to find full and effective compliance with the system, although it is not yet perfect. I've already mentioned the separately uh, categorized use of force. We have a remarkable change in um, this particular metric. We just have fewer instances of use of force. I credit that to leadership. I credit it to new policies and new training. The statistic that is most meaningful to me is in type two and type three uses of force, 2018 was lower than 2015, 2016, or 2017. In other words, progress. And lastly, a tripwire in many of these cases, as I talk to my colleagues around the United States, stops, searches, and seizures. We know from the data analytics platform that better training has helped, that the incidence of Terry stops versus social contacts, those are terms that are meaningful to this line of work, uh, are better clarified and occur in a more lawful manner. The May 1st examination of the disparate treatments of policing by communities of color is the lingering issue and one that needs to be continually addressed. And I believe that the current policy by the leadership in the Department of Close Monitoring and some significant reflection on the part of the Seattle Police Department deserve to find full and effective compliance in that area. Those are the 10 areas that are covered by assessments. And I, as I mentioned at the start, find that we are in full and effective compliance in each of them and continue the sustainment period. I would offer the following observations. First, these aspects of the Seattle Police Department, many of them are cited as national models. We should be proud of that. The New York Times, which used to report on the dire situation in Seattle, now runs stories about how good we are. I'm proud of that. But most of all, I'm proud of the men and women who serve the public every day as members of the Seattle Police Department. I think that sometimes we forget that they put their lives on risk to protect us. That's not always been the case, um, but it is now the subject of great pride 
that we have as good a police department as we do. In order to give you some sense of where we came from, um, I have compiled a short history lesson here. And I would ask you to join me in traveling back to 1996. In many ways, this is the start of the modern Seattle Police Department. The question at issue was Seattle Police Officer Earl Sonny Davis. Then Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper was the subject of sharp questioning by the city council as to why it took two and a half years for a case of allegations against two homicide detectives to be subject to a full review. The facts were that $10,000 was allegedly stolen by the veteran homicide detective, Mr. Davis, and there is and the next day, uh, arguably accompanied by his sergeant, um, they returned the $10,000 which was stolen. There were at least eight other detectives and officers who were aware of those allegations and they learned of them in 1996 and 1997. What happened after that was the mayor decided that we needed to have a commission <laughs> we are very fond of commissions. Um, charges were filed against Mr. D Davis and also uh, his sergeant uh, for allegedly helping Davis to return the money. Um, according to prosecutors and the accounts from that time period, Mr. Davis' partner, Mr. Steger, Officer Steger, never filed a formal report and basically nothing was done. Um, that's interesting because uh, there was a conversation between Mr. Steger and Sergeant Robert Gibo of the internal investigation section in 1997. Well, Steger and Gibo determined that their conversation or alleged that their conversation was between them as friends and not an official action. We also know that there was no official record kept of that particular event. Ultimately, after two trials, the uh, charges against Officer Davis were uh, dropped and the matter passed out of much attention. Other than the fact that we have a appointment of a police uh, review it was called, and this is the report is going to come out in 1999, three years later. It was called the Citizen Review Panel on Seattle Police Internal Investigations. And it was headed by a man of great civic reputation, retired Superior Court Judge Charles V. Johnson. The committee found, or the panel found that the prior issue in regards to the Seattle police, the 1970s corruption scandals, were not an issue. Um, Chief Stamper put forth a 12-point plan which echoed in the panel's recommendations. It's interesting to note just how long these issues have been around. A member of the Citizens Review panel was one prominent Seattle attorney, Jenny Durkin. The 12 point plan and the multiple recommendations of the Citizen Review Panel were the subject of a great deal of comment. Perhaps my favorite was the response of J.D. Miller, Vice President of SPOG, who, when asked about the recommendations, said, quote, We don't negotiate our contract with the panel, unquote. Out of that came the Office of Public Professional Responsibility. It's interesting to go back into the history and look at what was said at that time. Judge Johnson was the chair of the panel. Mike McKay, a former U.S. attorney, was a member. Jenny Durkin, a prominent lawyer, was a member. The 
the recently retired special agent in charge of the Seattle FBI office was uh, a member of the panel. When asked if the belief was that the police would do something after the uh, investigation and re recommendations of the panel, uh, the panel said almost unanimously, yes, we think they will. Otherwise, as Mr. McKay said, the city will find itself facing a substantial problem. This was all summarized by panel member Durkin, who said this all leads to one single theme, accountability. That takes us up to 1999. Um, I then found the next investigation, which was the Seattle Police Department's Office of Professional Accountability, policy recommendations for 2009-2010. The members of that panel will be familiar to members of the audience. They include the chair Terrence Carroll, Superior Court Judge, Jenny A. Durkin, Lorena Gonzalez, Pramaya Jayapal, and Mike McKay. Their final report talks about the same issues that were raised in 1999. Police accountability, performance of the Police Accountability Review Panel, and summarizing in their executive summary is the statement that, unfortunately, the public perception and reputation of the Seattle Police Department, including its disciplinary system and its ability to properly discharge its duties, can be tarnished by a limited number of troubled investigations or the actions of a minority of officers. This makes it imperative that the city respond decisively to cases that might indicate any problems with the integrity of the police accountability system. This is the report from 2009. The questions that um, the basis of the recommendations that were made in regards to the OPA, uh, the OPA Review Board, came down to one final recommendation, and I quote, all the panel's recommendations the city deems as not requiring collective bargaining prior to implementation should be implemented without delay. Any recommendations the city deems to require collective bargaining before implementation should be at the top of the city's agenda at the bargaining table. If agreement cannot be reached, the city should take the applicable proposals to arbitration with panel members available to assist as witnesses. In addition to the fullest extent of the law, existing aspects of the police accountability system endorsed by the panel in this report must be vigilantly protected from erosion at the bargaining table. We know that what happened next was a tragedy, and that is the shooting of John T. Williams and the investigation that, that touched off. I, in my review and research, I thought that this was as well covered as anywhere in uh, Chris Bailey, former King County Prosecuting Attorney's book, Seattle Justice. He was prominently involved in the corruption scandals of the 1970s, and not surprisingly, that's where he begins. No one has accused Seattle's current police force of personal corruption or graft, and I completely endorse that conclusion. The federal and county criminal trials of the 1970s through 74 put a stake into the heart of that vampire. The current Seattle Police Department is a professional outfit that puts a higher value on public service than private profit. However, he then notes the following. 
In 2010, as the John Williams inquest was about to begin, individual members of the department, speaking in their Gould newsletter, Guild newsletter, defended the actions Officer Burke against the, quote, lynch mob, unquote, deployed the socialism inherent in requiring diversity training and indicated that civilian review boards were not to be feared as their decisions could be ignored. Mr. Bailey continues by saying, these characterizations are taken from reporters describing the contents of articles in the Police Guild newsletter, The Guardian, as in the last half of 2010, prior to the Williams Quest. Unfortunately, I was not able to read them as they are available for viewing not by members of the public, but only by members of the police department. In their opposition to the federal court order, that's in this matter, over 100 officers filed their own lawsuits to prevent new rules on police use of force. The department itself fought against public release of dashboard videos, only losing that, Supreme Court, that argument in the Supreme Court. That's where we were in 2011, 2012, when we started. The difference now is just profound. The force is better trained, it's better led, and it's more in tune with the times. Nationally and locally, the police philosophy has changed. It no longer consists of the warrior model in which an officer in a problem situation attempts to immediately control the behavior of everyone around them to more of a guardian model where the goal is to diffuse violence and listen to the actual concerns of the people who are upset, all at the same time while balancing the need to be safe as ser when serving as a police officer. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are better, but we're not perfect. After a lot of discussion, I thought it was appropriate at this time for you to see the footage the in-camera or in-car camera footage of the Officer Shepard incident on June 22, 2014. I'm very proud of the efforts of the Department at Transparency. I am dismayed at the efforts which have been engaged in of attempting to spin the facts of that incident, which frankly have been nonstop. I ask you to look at the shortened version of this and note a couple of things. One is the presence of a number of police officers, the out of control demeanor of the person who's being arrested, and the conduct of the officer. In other words, see it yourself. See what you think. Right. Okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen, okay? My patience is done. Okay. It's done. <laughs> It's over. So okay. somebody's going to go to jail. Who's it going to be? Nobody touched any anybody. Members? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So how matter. are you going to take anybody you to jail if nobody touched you anybody? You come over Shepherd? here. I didn't threaten anybody. You unless you have, do you have it you on paper? Okay. Do you, please don't touch me. Please don't touch me. Please don't touch me. Please don't touch me. Roll over. Please don't touch You're me. under arrest. Why am I under arrest? Why am I under arrest? But don't, can you tell me why I'm under arrest? Can you tell me why I'm not I'm calm. I'm calm. I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. She did. She said you made a threat. I did not make a threat. Miss Kelsey, I really made a threat. I made a threat. That's crazy. That's crazy. Like, seriously? I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. Can you please document your threat? Can you please document your threat? Because I never made a threat. Like, seriously? No, seriously. Okay, well, can Miss Shelby come confirm her threat? Because I did not make a threat. I didn't make a threat. I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. Officer Shelfer, like seriously, did I make a threat? But did I make a threat? But did I make a threat? No, like seriously, can you please document this? I'm not gonna get in the car because I did not make a threat. I did not make a threat. I really did not make a threat. No, please talk to 
me, please. I did not make a threat. How are you going to arrest me and I did not make a threat? What we're going to do is we're going to take you down to precinct. How are you going to take me down to precinct and I didn't even make a threat? You need to calm down. I'm calm. You're trying to de-escalate here. You're escalating this by... Fucking bitch. She kicked me. Kick me. There are a couple of things that are significant to the court in that. The first is the young woman is handcuffed on her back in the back seat of a police car with a bunch of officers standing around her. She kicks the officer. And then there's a pause, and then he comes back into the car, and he punches her in the face. That resulted in a disciplinary action taken by Chief O'Toole, as was their right. The officer, Hans Bogg, proceeded to appeal that. The decision of Chief O'Toole was overturned and the officer termination was rescinded and he was awarded back pay. The briefing in that case changes from case from forum to forum. The louder milk hearings say one thing the arbitration says another. The court today doesn't need to decide if who is right and who is wrong. Instead, it asks the question if a labor arbitrator whose livelihood is based on her continued selection should have the ability to overturn the decision of a respected, trained, experienced chief of police. That's what the collective bargaining agreement addresses by going back to this particular system. The questions that the court asks are, does this fully comply with the Constitution and the laws of the United States? Second, does this ensure public and officer safety? And third, does this promote public confidence in the Seattle Police Department and its officers? My decision today is not about Officer Shepard. It is about the changes to the accountability procedures that are found in the collective bargaining agreement so as to weaken the system that was established in the accountability ordinance. But that's not the ultimate question to me. The question is, does it so weaken the system to be a violation of the consent decree? The court finds that they do. I would like it very clear, because this has been a point of a great deal of confusion in the minds of some people, the court does not reject the collective bargaining agreement. Most importantly, the increased compensation of officers continues. The Inspector General and the Office of Police Accountability are preserved. But it is issues like the standard of proof in labor arbitrations, the 180-day timetable, which is alleged to basically be there to help officers avoid discipline, and the narrowing of the subpoena power of the OPA are concerns of the court. It is now up to the parties to show the court that the discipline and accountability procedures negotiated in the CPA meet constitutional muster. A system which produces decisions like the Shepard decision is challenged to do that. <clears throat> Moving on then, um, and the reasons for our order today will be more fully 
filled out in the written order that we file. In the last two or three months, um, the Seattle police have been subject to a great deal of comment concerning Seattle's homeless situation and the conditions of the downtown area. Some voices have been so far as calling for drastic action to resuscitate Seattle. So let's get a couple of things clear about the court's view of what the Seattle Police Department can and should do. Some percentage of Seattle's homeless are in that condition due to personal financial events. We do not arrest people because they lost their home or their apartment. Some percentage of Seattle's homeless are mentally ill. The Seattle Police Department is a national leader in dealing with this issue with treatment and not incarceration. Some homeless are drug addicts and some are both drug addicts and mentally ill. We know a number of homeless people make up a disproportionate number of arrests and bookings by the Seattle Police Department. In 2018, the SPD booked 1,000 homeless people into jail a combined 3,211 times. <coughs> 3.2 for each of those 1,000 individuals. That represents 20% of the 2018 bookings, despite the homeless making up approximately 1% of the city's population. People who are arrested for typical homeless crimes Failure to appear, shoplifting, outstanding warrants, trespassing, tend not to be violent criminals, but they clearly impact our city and the resources of the Seattle Police Department to deal with them. Some people believe that the police can arrest our way out of homelessness. This misses the point. First, the police don't control who gets prosecuted. That is the prosecution side of the criminal justice system. Secondly, it prevents the Seattle Police Department from dealing with the people who are need to be taken off the street, the drug dealers, the violent criminals, the people who commit theft, assaults, and robberies. It can be politically expedient to assume that a handful of anonymous police officers speak on behalf of the 1,200 or plus members of the SPOG and of the Seattle Police Department. They don't. They don't any more than I do. The Seattle Police Department is part of the criminal justice system. Issues like reducing recidivism, fair treatment of defendants in criminal cases, underlying root causes of the problem behavior, timely resolution of cases and reducing incarceration are not controlled by the Seattle Police Department. As Chief Pest has said, we cannot arrest our way out of homelessness. The court agrees with that. It's interesting to note that at least three current or former Seattle Police Department members are running for the City Council at this time. That strikes the court as a more productive way to leverage the experience and knowledge of Seattle Police Department members. In closing then, I will offer the following thoughts. I am very proud of the Seattle Police. I am very proud of the fact that in a time when we have asked them to make tremendous changes, they have done so. There's an acknowledgement that there is no end game for reform. As our community changes, as the need for police services changes, we continue our process of critical self-analysis, review, and improvement. The men and women of the Seattle Police Department have worked hard to achieve full and effective compliance with the federal consent decree. They have been subject to an unreasonable perhaps, level of attention from me as a federal judge, and I'm proud of what they have accomplished. They've embraced new training, standards, and oversight mechanisms, in addition to paperwork, that 
deserve our thanks and admiration for what they've accomplished. Quoting from Chief Best's letter, I would leave you with these statistics. The data published openly on the Seattle Police Department site show the following. Of the hundreds of thousands of calls for service to which the Seattle Police Department officers respond annually, fewer than one-fifth of one percent, one-fifth of one percent result in any use of force, and fewer than 0.004 percent of these calls result in a use of force significant enough to cause potential serious injury. We know we have got an increase in the number of calls. Some statistics suggest as much as, as a 25 percent increase, and yet our use of force remains empirically rare. I credit this to the Seattle Police Department, to the Office of Police Accountability, to the Office of the Inspector General, to the Community Police Commission, and to the leadership of the Seattle Police Department, but most importantly to the men and women who serve as officers in the department. In preparing my remarks today, I came across what I thought were some remarkable statistics. We know that Seattle at this point ranks as the most educated city in the United States. And that's especially true for people who have moved here recently. The Census Bureau says that 35% of Americans aged 25 and older have completed a bachelor degree. That's equal to the percentage that had completed high school in 1950, which is more my vintage. Not completing high school, but being born. As of 2017, 63% of Seattle residents had, excuse me, 63% of city residents aged 25 and older had a four-year college degree. Among the 50 largest cities in the country, Seattle is the only one to hit the 60% mark. If we went back to 2000, where I started these remarks, less than 47% had a college degree, 47% to 63%. There are now a total of 337,000 college graduates aged 25 and older living in Seattle, plus another 23,000 who are under the age of 25. Among Seattle millennials, 73% are college graduates. Those statistics are not the same for my generation, and I am acutely aware that there is a perceived situation where we are leaving some people behind. I don't know what we do about that. Um, I think we just have to be vigilant that we recognize that all types live in this city. But I would leave you with the following thought. Seattle is on the verge of becoming a first class major international city. To do that, our physical landscape is changing, the nature of our economy is changing, and the expectations change. Were the mayor here, she would be happy to agree that we have traffic issues, we have commute time issues, we have cost of living issues, we have homelessness issues. Please recognize that the role of the Seattle Police Department is in part to deal with certain aspects of those changes. The homelessness debate certainly has occupied a lot of time recently. And I hope that it does not uh, deter us from examining the questions that we need to examine. I'm proud of the accomplishments of the department. I regret having to find lack of full and effective compliance in the area of accountability, but I now leave it up to the parties to show me that they are performing to constitutional expectations. 
That is the conclusion of the court's remarks. I'll ask counsel if they have anything they wish to say at this time. Um, thank you, Your Honor, for sharing your thoughts and background on the order today, and I'll look forward to reviewing the written order with my colleagues. All right. Likewise, Your Honor, there's a lot here to digest, but we appreciate your time, and uh, we'll be carefully uh, perusing your order. Likewise for the Community Police Commission, Your Honor. It's, uh, Mr. Perez, your, your filings in, in regards to this question, I thought were well done. You, the CPC deserves condemnation for, for doing that. Thank they you. They were helpful to the court. Mr. Bob, anything from my trusted monitor? Is uh, the written order going to be released today? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and get it out. Um, today, I believe, is a Thursday, so it probably will be sometime early next week, but it will be out promptly. Thank you all for coming today. Um, there's a lot of good news. There's some work still to do. Um, I think we're all up to doing it. We will be in recess. Thank you, Council. All rise. Court is in recess.